Thank you very much. I, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, is bring you back to the grassroots level, to Syria, um, and try to um, um, make some sense uh, from the perspective of Syrians and Syrian society of this really excellent report. I think those of you who've already had a chance to read it will have noticed as you went through that there were certain areas where there were some really curious outcomes. And I think also the author wanted to make uh, uh, more comments and perhaps didn't feel um, particularly ready to at the time, so I, I, I will. Um, uh, Arushi, I, I will make some strong comments about the humanitarian aid community in general. This is not a criticism of UNHCR. Um, it's from an academic, it's uh, I think a criticism of the way mm -hmm. in which we all often tend to work from top down from our own understandings and the way we also tend to implement templates um, mm -hmm. which have worked in the past and may not always work in the present. So forgive me for just being um, very general in giving a kind of socio-historical background. I just want to remind everybody when we talk about Syria, we're actually talking about the area called Bilad al-Sham, the Levant, that uh, the, the, the neighbor to the south on the Mediterranean, uh, the birthplace of the alphabet, and also the place where two competing cities uh, uh, vie for the, the record of being the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, Aleppo and Damascus. Um, uh, the breadbasket of the Roman uh, Empire, the birthplace of Christianity, because I'm using Bilad as sham as the, as the definition, um, an area conquered um, by Islam in the, uh, in the beginning of the eighth century, a place where you find temples to the local gods, Baal, then to Jupiter, uh, then uh, churches and basilicas, the one in Damascus, of course, for to uh, uh, St. John the Baptist, uh, now is the, the main mosque, uh, a place we should feel very comfortable about and a people we should be very comfortable about as a culture and society, really not that very different from ourselves or what I'm going to call a kind of Mediterranean-based uh, extended family society. Um, Obviously, uh, there were a lot of distortions that took place in Syria's history beginning with the end of the 1960s when the Ba'ath Party and its socialist agenda became um, quite uh, pronounced. Uh, but I would say that the traditional family structure uh, with um, the, uh, the third generation, that silver power group, uh, the elderly, very much a part of the family, even up until the late, uh, I was in Syria working on a number of research projects in 2011, uh, mainly with Iraqi refugees, but one of the things I recognized at the time is that in spite of a growing middle class and a lot of very wealthy people, there were only one or two <coughs> old people's homes. The elderly are not put away. The elderly are part of the family. And I think that's mm. important in answering some of the, the kind mm. of uh, issues that emerged here. Um, Syria is also a refuge state. Uh, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it really became the new home for what I'm going to call either near diaspora, or you can use whatever term you want, but it became a home for Armenians, for Kurds, for Palestinians, mm -hmm. and of course before that, for the Circassians and the Chechnyans. What does that mean? It basically led to something that many people admired about Syria, which was its kind of conviviality. Some people called it local cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. something which actually is still present in Damascus. Any of you who have a chance to go to Damascus, it's still there. So a lot of the, the, the media attention on uh, the, the, um, um, the secular uh, and non-secular aspects of this struggle, I think, are, are, are overplayed. Um, the other things I want to say about Syria is that it was a middle-income country with a very sound education system, mm -hmm. and up until 2011, an excellent healthcare system. Uh, based on the work of a single Minister of Health who held that post from about 1980 to 2005, trained at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States and implemented an amazing health care program, so much so that even Lebanon permitted him to launch polio vaccination raids into Lebanon up until 2011. Of course, that system has collapsed. Uh, but that collapse, I think, is why some of the issues that emerge in this report uh, are there. Um, First, I'm, I'm just going to say that we should keep in mind that there are about 6 million displaced Syrians, internally displaced Syrians, and 2.5 who fled across borders. Mm -hmm. uh, the point I want to make is most of these 6 million could cross a border but haven't. And the reason they haven't is most Syrians are afraid that if they cross a border, they will not be able to return. Assad has made this very clear for the approximately 100 to 150,000 Palestinians who made their homes in Syria after 1948, that those who have fled may not return. 
So there is a reluctance to register. There's a reluctance to be classified as a refugee. It spells, it's a word which reminds Syrians of what happened to the Palestinians, and then later on what happened to middle-class Sunni Iraqi. There are still many Iraqi refugees in Syria. They can't go back to Iraq, and they can't go forward. So not being able to return is a very strong reason why people will not register in the way that is required by UNHCR and other agencies in order to access aid. Uh, many Syrian refugees prefer to go to private clinics if they can bring the money together, or to Islamic foundations, charities, which don't require you to give all this personal information which Syrians are afraid will end up in the hands of internal security someday, number one. Um, so the fact that there's such a high level of aged in the refugee population, aged and disabled, doesn't surprise me if you consider that the health system mm -hmm. in Syria has collapsed. Who try to cross a border? Those that have elderly who can no longer access their, their high blood pressure pills, who can no longer get the kind of medication and insulin they need for the diabetes or what have you. It's not always that these illnesses have not been diagnosed before, <coughs> but there's no longer a way for them to access that care. And I think that's really important. The kind of screening that's needed may not necessarily require all the kind of invasive tests that are required, as long as we're willing to accept um, uh, people statements. Say when they fled, they didn't always take cards with them. But I, I'm just saying that I think sometimes we're extremely efficient in the way we insist on registration, and particularly when it comes to health care. And this, I think, is, has emerged uh, from the material. Um, I was really glad to see that there wasn't anything about early marriage or gender-based violence in this report. Um, and I'm going, the reason I'm saying that is as early as, well, I guess it was about the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, I won't say which agency, but I was approached as director of the Refugee Studies Center to launch a study into early marriage and domestic violence, uh, gender-based violence, particularly in, in Zaatari camp in Jordan. And I responded by saying, I don't think those are the most important issues. I think those happen to be the issues that we in the West, in the United States in particular, are concerned about, and I think uh, we need to understand early marriage. The rural population of Syria has practiced early marriage for a very long time. 14, 15, 16 year olds are very often married within the community. I, my time is up, is no, it? No, 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 no you oh. must go on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that early marriage, which was used as a code word for prostitution, was something that really wasn't understood. Of course, there is prostitution, there's trafficking, but the the tradition of early marriage has very important social roots within the Syrian population. So I felt that the early, the early focus in, during that, that, that first couple of years uh, uh, within the, uh, the humanitarian aid system was misplaced. In addition, and I'll use the example of the Médecins Sans Frontières because I think they made an amazing turnaround. I had a, a delegation of uh, M uh, MSF um, specialists um, to visit me from Lebanon who were really quite concerned when they first went into Lebanon, they were expecting to deal with communicable diseases because they were using the model that they had developed in, in, in Darfur, in South Sudan, and other places, and they were going to just simply apply it with the population in Syria. And they came and they said, we've got a real problem here, because that's not really the issue. Of course, now polio has become the issue, but the issue is definitely diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, and other uh, uh, problems that you find very commonly in um, middle-income countries. Now, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières has since made a direct turnaround and are trying very hard to deal with these non-communicable diseases, but I think it's something we should all look at and take as a lesson. Um, additionally, the, the psychological stress is, again, something that we need to look at very carefully. The UNHCR uh, learned a lot of lessons uh, looking at uh, dealing with Iraqi refugees, and one of the things they learned was that they could not deal with psychosocial elements, psychological stress on a one-to-one -one basis efficiently or effectively because the Iraqi were not willing to come forward on a one-to-one -one basis. And they set up community drop-in centers, which really were um, centers to deal with psychological distress uh, for the families in Damascus and other places, and it was very effective. And I'm surprised that that same model hasn't worked, although I must say, and that wasn't part of your mandate, but the Turkish government in the camps and the local, uh, and the local um, hosting communities in Turkey have done a wonderful job, and they are dealing with psychological stress on a family basis, because that's the way in which not only Syrians, but most Arabs work, not on an individual basis, but in terms of the family. Um, so I... I'm not surprised that the invisibility of the elderly and the disabled um, 
was something that uh, uh, that you, I mean, was there, but it has really come up uh, in your uh, in your study. Um, it's it's not uncommon for the Arab family to uh, keep the elderly and the disabled at home, uh, but in this case, what's happened is when there have been really significant disturbances, they have crossed a border in order to try and get that help. And that's one of the reasons why I think um, your findings have shown so clearly uh, the, the very large numbers um, uh, of refugees who fit into this category. I think you said 30%. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, I want to say something which is, um, I'm beginning to believe more and more, I'm sorry to, to kind of go into a bit of a political economy, but um, Yazid Sayek yesterday wrote a very interesting piece on Syria in which he predicted uh, that by the end of 2015, uh, Bashar al-Assad will be very firmly back in control of Syria. I think that is the, the probably the, the most likely scenario. And what will happen? Those who haven't actually registered uh, will go back. Some who've registered will feel out the situation to see whether they can go back. But the elderly, the disabled, those wounded in particular, will not go back. Because one of the reasons why anybody wounded through um, I think you said it was about 80%. In Syria, mm -hmm. the Assad government has made very clear that they are treated as though they're members of the opposition. And it doesn't matter whether you're 50, 60, or 70. If you are wounded, it's assumed that you're a part of the opposition. And if you go for treatment, you will be arrested and probably disappeared. So these people will never go back. Uh, even if uh, in the next few years some Syrians go back, I think this population you're talking about are a long term um, uh, ethical. Uh, if not economic problem for the humanitarian aid world. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Dawn, I'd like to thank you for that really rich uh, anthropological, historical um, uh, presentation, uh, giving us a really in-depth account of the situation. It's a fantastically lucid explanation of why the elderly and disa disabled people are, are invisible in the region, wh which is uh, amazing. And thank you also for the predictions for the future. That's uh, very helpful too. So thank you very much. Um, we've had some very good panelists here. We've had um, a really good um, empirical account. We've had a field account. We've had uh, a donor account and now some anthropology. So it's, it's been a very rich panel so far. We are going to go into plenary discussion now. Um, and uh, we have some questions coming through from our online participants, which I will have a look at in a minute. But the first thing I'd like to do is to go to, to Imran, please, because I understand that you have uh, the first uh, comment from the floor and you can get our discussion rolling. So Imran, thank you. Could you say who you are yes, and uh, your affiliation and so on? Thank you. 